Hello, I'm Chuck Phillip, and welcome to another edition of Southern Home Talk. Uh, this is when I worked at the railroad for CSX in the 90s. Worked there a little over five years, and that's the break room. Uh, at the Days Inn in New Orleans, that's where they held the crews out. And so if you're on a train coming from Mobile to New Orleans, uh, they would hold you out at this hotel, and it was first in and first out when they called you to take the train back. We had a pool table in there. It was kind of cool. So... Uh, here it is the next day. Uh, we're on a locomotive uh, going back to necessarily always be a CSX locomotive. Uh, also had a wide body, so we'd always make a switch move to get that first out because it had air conditioning on it. And so I'm kind of inspecting uh, these locomotives as we go by them, make sure they're immued correctly, um, just make sure there's no issues. We're waiting for this train to get by uh, so we can go. And I believe this is going to be an intermodal train. That's where you have these uh, containers on top of these flat cars. Uh, that was a priority mail of the railroad back then. Uh, they would really want to get them across the road as quick as they could. And it, we could run those at 70 miles an hour. And those would stop relatively quicker, too, because they were a lighter train and you had more brakes on all those cars to stop it. Uh, they also would run you right on through. They wouldn't put you in the side and didn't have to unless Amtrak got in the way. So we're waiting for him to get on by. He's actually coming into the Gentilly yard. Uh, the, the, train, the tower is going to tell him where to go and where to put his train up and cut off the locomotives. Uh, sometimes they just leave the locomotives on them uh, because another crew would be picking it up and taking it over to the other side of maybe Union Pacific or whatever. Now that's my engineer right there. Uh, we've been sitting there a pretty good while since so taking him a nap. We could do that because you know, a lot of times you sit in these sidings for hours. And so as long as someone was awake, uh, that, that it was accepted to do that back then. And so I'm sitting up here just waiting for us to get the light to come out and got my binoculars there to uh, see if there's any hazards in the rail up ahead. And because we hit washing machines, all kinds of stuff that people put out there. That's a wrecked truck over there across the road. And that was almost was my biggest fear is hitting one of them, especially a tanker truck, uh, because it could, you know, erupt and kill the whole crew. and. And also these lumber trucks as well, they turn those boards into little splinters and they just go up everywhere. You can even come inside the cab with you. So we're about to cross this bridge here. There's a defect detector. And they had these every so often. And when you go by them, they would sound off, you know, letting you know if you had any defects in your train. And every defect detector was different. shakiness of the camera because you know those cameras back then just wasn't as good as they are now and so we're about to get into this siding here uh, we're gonna let, they're gonna let another train run around us here I believe and if you're on a mixed freight train it could take you 10 or 12 hours to get across the road because of having to go in these sidings and wait for other trains to come by and that was when Amtrak was running so if it got anywhere close uh, they'd put you in there because they gave that priority as well and so Anyway, the rule was back then, uh, you'd get down on the ground and inspect the other train as it came past you to see if it had any problems, like uh, dragging equipment uh, or even hot journals on it. Also, if it had any flat spots in the wheels, it'd make a real loud, loud clacking noise. And so we'd notify the crew that they had some issues with their cars, and you'd give them a guess about how far back in the train it is uh, so the conductor would know where to go look whenever they got it stopped safely. And that's what we did. If I found a hot journal, uh, the defect detector would tell you uh, hot box detected, axle number 231. And so I'd walk back about 231 axles and test that axle and plus the axles on the uh, five cars forward of that and five cars af after that as well to make sure I didn't miss any. And there was times where uh, when I'd find these hot journals that would melt the stick that I had and we'd have to make a decision on what to do with it depending on where we were. Uh, there was one time where I actually rode back on the car uh, with it at restricted speed, which is around 15 miles an hour, until we could get it set out. 
Uh, but yeah, you didn't want to ring that journal off and be on the ground. So th those defect detectors were there and they seemed to work pretty well, uh, especially identifying hot boxes back then or hot journals. Now, before they had the roller bearing uh, journals, they had what they call friction journals. And th they also called these car inspectors car knockers for that reason, because they had this little hook. They would pick up the lid on those and pour uh, oil in it. That's what it depended on that oil to keep that uh, uh, that joint there lubricated or that axle lubricated and but they don't have those anymore so all of my roller bearing now for the most part I don't believe they have any of those uh, journals anymore or those th that type of journal anyway uh, but thanks for watching guys I may put some more of these up I got some more of these available and when I get time I may go through some of them and uh, put them up there so you can kind of sort of see what it was like to be a uh, conductor for the railroad now the conductor's position was he was the boss of the train and so I was in charge of having the consist of it and, that's, and also making sure, you know, where the hazardous chemicals were in the train in case there was a problem. I uh, would get with the authorities there so they would know what they were dealing with. But really it was a joint effort between me and the engineer. You know, even though I was in charge of the train, I didn't consider myself a, a bully boss. I mean, we really worked diligently together to make sure that we got the train across the road as safely as we could and as efficiently as we could as well. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and take care.